Welcome to the Real Church Podcast. You can learn more about Real Church online at realchurch.today. Now here's today's message. This morning, I want to talk to you about the blessing and the curse, which is something that in ever since we, well, I started this when I was an evangelist. Um, I, I, I wanted to leave, I always want to leave people with something. And I, and I heard a pastor do this one, uh, you know, at a place and, you know, John Osteen used to really bless the people of Lakewood every Sunday. And, um, and uh, Joel, I think he still blesses the reading of God's word. And, and uh, I, just, I just decided when I was an evangelist, I, I got to leave the people with something. And there's nothing more powerful than a blessing. And so the blessing that I speak over you every week, I started that when we were on the road. And pastors would pick up on that. And they would say, man, I need to start doing that. And I said, well, I picked that up from some other people. We really need to speak the blessing of God over, over God's people. And, um, and so today I want to talk to you about the blessing and the curse. Because it really is an either or. We either enjoy the blessing of God or we walk under some kind of curse. And so I want to talk to you about that this morning in the light of where we are as a nation. I don't think that I have to tell you all, this group this morning, the history of America. But I think it would suffice to say that our country was founded on the Judeo-Christian principles that we teach as a church. Um, at this point, it still says on our currency, in God we trust. I'm not sure how many people carry that in their pocket and still believe it, but it does still say it on the American currency, in God we trust. That was put on there by our patriotic forefathers, if you will, who founded this nation and realized that God had given them this place of freedom. I was reading this morning a little bit about the Revolutionary War and how many thousands of men and women gave their life fighting the British crown. Uh, something like 17,000 people died just from disease during that war. Uh, 6,700 men killed. Um, don't, didn't, I can't even remember how many thousands were wounded. But uh, all in the cause of trying to keep our uh, of freedoms in America. They had worked hard to establish this country and the freedoms of religion here. And they didn't want to fall back under the tyranny of, of a king telling them what they could and could not do. We know that there has been other moments in our history where there's been a fight for freedom. Um, I'm not going to relive all that this morning, but I think it that we know today, I think you know, that this is what our country was found, founded on. And I would tell you, this is, now this is uh, what we call extra biblical this morning. I'm not, obviously I'm not talking to you out of the Bible right now. I'm talking to you out of my own feelings. But it is my feeling that the country that I've lived in all my life has enjoyed the blessings of God as a country because of the founding of the way that our country was founded. I cannot tell you that I believe we're still under those blessings because of the current leadership we have or most of the leadership that we've had in my lifetime. I'm just saying it's my feeling that we have walked in a blessing that we received and we, we have received from God over and again because our country was founded on biblical principles. Now, if you go to Washington, D.C., we've been several times now, and the one thing as a Christian that will stand out to you if you keep your eyes open is everywhere you go, the oldest buildings in Washington, D.C. will have scriptures engraved on the cornerstones because those men who built this country, they may have had their flaws, and, you know, we may not even always get a true picture certainly now we will not get a true picture of history because people are rewriting it but but what you will find there is they left something in stone and it was the word of god and it's it's captivating 
to stand on those statues and read those scriptures or to stand in front of those buildings and read those scriptures and know, okay, what, what I've been taught all my life in church is real. We founded this country on God's word. We may have gotten far from it, but we certainly were founded that way. And I believe because of that, we have walked as a country under the favor of God and the blessings of God for most of my lifetime. What I want to talk to you this morning about is what some people call, I don't know if it's the best, I don't know if it's the best terminology to describe it, but it's called the Balaam principle or the Balaam plan, if you will, to destroy the people of God. And it's found in Numbers chapter 22 all the way through 25 or so. I'm not going to read it all to you this morning, but I want to give you some of the highlights of it. You know this story well because it's one of those that you were, when you were told as a child, you, you still haven't forgot about that talking donkey, have you? I love this story. I've told it to my kids and, and like I, I told and now I tell it to my grandkids and, and I've, I've actually had to act it out, you know, for the kids when we do our little sleepovers on Sunday nights and, and, and so I've had to do the little, you know, acting out and, and I, I, can, I can still hear them. Micah, the, the last time I did it, Micah, you know, he's the oldest, so he's, he's ahead of everybody. He's like, got that look on his face, kind of grins. He says, did that donkey really talk? I said, he sure did. He really did. Greg, are you just kidding us? Uh, no, nope, that's in your Bible. That donkey really did talk. How many of y'all know if you get hit hard enough, you'll talk too? Huh? <laughs> well, here's the story, and I'm not going to read it all to you, but uh, the children of Israel in chapter 22, it says they had, they had uh, set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side of Jordan. So you get this picture. You know, God's moving, God's people are moving around, and we're not talking about two or three people. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. And they come with their stuff and their, and their, their cattle and their sheep. And uh, the, the king of, of Moab, Balak, was not very happy about the idea that the Israelites were coming around because they're eating up his stuff. Their animals are drinking the water. And the Bible says he had heard about what happened to the Amorites. Y'all, don't y'all love those stories? I mean, all those ite stories, you know, where the where the Israelites beat the Amorites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and it, it Jebusites and the Moabites and it just goes on and on and on. I love it. They're all great stories. Well, those kings heard those stories. They were true. And so Balak is like, oh man, uh, hey, hey. They're moving into Moab territory. And so he wasn't happy about it. And so he, he searched around and uh, he, he said this. He said, find me, a, find me somebody. And they found Balaam. And Balaam was a, a man that was known to prophesy the things of God. And he said, come now, in verse 6, he says, come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. So the king of Moab, Balak, says, oh, man. He said, these people are bad to the bone. They take everything they get, you know, everywhere they go, they take the land and they, they, they eat it up and they defeat the people. And so he says, I need a man of God to prophesy against them. And so he got Balaam and Balaam come along and, and uh, he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to curse these people. The only problem is Balaam did hear from God. And so... Although the king told him to go prophesy, Balaam just couldn't do it. Every time he'd show up, you know, the king say, go do it. He'd go there to speak and God give him a good word. <laughs> and he says, uh, he said, take that word and go with him. And he, he, he go and he, he says, I, I did. But he said, the word that God puts in my mouth, that's what I got to say. He said that in chapter, in verse 38, he said, the word that God puts in my mouth I have to say and every time I get around these people of God God just says bless them man bless them give bless them 
And he's like, ah, that's not what I want you to do. And he says in verse 8 of chapter 23, he says, How will I curse whom God has not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord has not defied? Can I just tell you, <coughs> excuse me, when God's favor is on you, there's nothing the enemy can do about that. And when God reserves you a parking spot, people will draw right by it. When God sets you up a house, you can drive right by it. And God say, whoa, 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 come back here. This is the one. Because I got something here for you. You can drive by a building for year after year. And God say, whoop, I've been saving that for you. Because that's God's favor. And the, and, the, and the world doesn't recognize it. It's just been God's favor is just on you. And, 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 and as God's people, we need to realize what God's favor is and where it comes from and how it happens in your life. Let me just tell you something. God's favor does not just happen because you sign on the dotted line. You don't just pray that one prayer. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I know I talk about it a lot, but I, I, I don't think we, that the church as a whole is getting it. I want you to get it. You, you, don't, just, you don't just walk into God's blessings because you... You, you, you walk the aisle or you sign the membership card or you, you, you just tell people, yeah, yeah I'm a Christian. It's, it's, it's so much more than that. I, I know we're just going to keep going back to last Sunday, but, but you, you really have to be connected to the vine. You have to walk in the presence and the power of Jesus. And when you walk in him, and, and he says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. So and when you love him and you walk in his commandments, walking in his commandments is why I speak it over you every week. If we hearken to your voice and obey and do all that you say unto us this day, then all these blessings shall be upon us. The favor of God happens because we walk in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ and we stay connected to him. And so he says, how am I going to touch somebody who has a favor of God on their life? How am I going to curse somebody that God's already put a blessing on? You think my curse is going to be stronger than God's blessing? That man of God's smart, ain't he? He goes, man, I can curse that. God's already blessed that. I can't do nothing about that. Verse 20, chapter 23 he said, Behold, I've, I've received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. <laughs> he said, He hath not beheld, listen to this, he hath not beheld, he's talking about God, he hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. So basically, he's saying, listen, can, can I tell you what, what Balaam is saying to this Moabite king. He's saying, look, the thing that Pastor Krausen speaks over his church every week, it's real. If we hearken to God's voice and we don't walk in evil, then we receive the blessing of the Lord. When we don't walk in holiness before God and we partake of the things of the world and live in evil, then we already have a curse on us. But, O oh, king, you are asking me to curse a people who are walking right before God and they've got God's blessing on them. I can't do anything about it, man. Now, that is a fact. And if you're not living that, then you just haven't had a rhyme of word about it. But when you know it and you live it, Brother Maddox always used to say, I guess he still says, he says, he says, uh, doing right things adds up over time. God watches. What, how you live matters. He always said that we had this uh, terminology about the school. He said, uh, um, Christianity is not a religion. It's a lifestyle. That's why they called it lifestyle school, because, because it's, 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 it, it's who we are. We don't just wear a label. We live a lifestyle. And doing right things does add up because if you do them for the right reason, because God watches that and he says, they don't just, look, look at this, they don't just keep my commandments because they're afraid of the curse of the law. 
You understand the curse of the law. We know that the curse of the law was death, right? But we have life in Christ Jesus, right? Because that's, we got a new law. And it's the law of spirit and life. And so he says, you, you walk in the law of sin and death. Well, we don't, we don't just act right because we're afraid God's going to kill us. That's Old Testament stuff. We've been set free from the law of sin and death. We now live in the law of life in Christ Jesus. And that is that we love him because he first loved us. We love him because he gave his life for us. We follow him because we desire to be like him. We don't live holy because we don't want to be like the world. We live holy because we want to be like him. We live holy because we want the same fruit in our life that he had. And by the way, we found out last week, we're in a co-mission with him to win the world from their sins. That's why we live like we live. And God takes note of that. And God blesses that. And he says, this is a person that is in connection with me. They're walking in right, right standing before me. And they love me. They're not perfect, but they're working. They're, they're doing everything they know to do to bring glory to my name. And I'm going to bless them. And I'm going to increase them so that the world will see that their God is working in their life. And oh man, Balaam said, man, dude, I don't know what you expect me to do. Because I, I, can't, I can't counteract that. I'm telling you, I'm trying to encourage you in the Lord this morning. The, the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy, but God's come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. He wants to bless you and help you, and he wants to do it to increase his name in the earth. <laughs> but the story's not over. And this is what needs to be revealed to the church today. The only way that the nation of Israel could fall was not from without. It was only from within. We've seen this over the course of history, and you've heard this in history class. Well, I don't know if they even teach it anymore, but when I was a child, which seems like 7,000 years ago now, because things were so different, that's what it really feels like to me. It's like another world to me, what I grew up in. But my teachers, you know, started the class with prayer and, you know, I don't know. It's just I lived in a different world. I, I must have been born on another planet. But, but they, would, they would teach us history and, they, and, they, and, and they, they, they told us that, you know, that honoring God mattered and and this is, this is why we, we didn't stand to honor the flag because we were just Americans. It was part of our Christian duty to honor our nation and honor what God was doing in our nation. And now he was blessing. And, uh, and they knew that there, was, there were things that we shouldn't do. They taught us right from wrong because there was a reason. There, there was a reason that God was blessing our country. And they taught us that in history that when 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 the Roman Empire fell they didn't fall to another country the Roman Empire was the greatest thing the world had ever seen to that day our country has been modeled after the ideas of the Roman Empire and how many of y'all know history repeats itself and and we're just too dumb sometimes to realize it's happening and and they taught us that it got great but their greatness blinded them and they allowed sin to become the norm in Rome. And, and a little bit of sexual promiscuity became total in the street immorality. And that immorality is what tore down the great country of Rome. The great empire, if you will, of Rome. This is the great work and the deception of the enemy. I can't destroy them from without. I can't just curse them with something that'll end them. I've got to tear down what's on the inside. You see why I'm always talking to you about your inside, your connection with God. 
did forget all this frivolous religious fluff on the outside forget that garbage what matters is am i in a real relationship with the lord jesus christ i mean when i'm alone and i'm not around a bunch of church members do i really talk to god do i pray to god do i worship god in my truck going down the road do i have a closet that i so to speak where i get alone with the lord and i just worship him do i really bow before him do i really honor him do i really ask him that's where the rubber meets the road and so they tried a new thing Balak said we can't curse him I can't even get the man of God to do it how about how about we get the prettiest most evil intended women we have and let's send them into Israel let's tell them to go hang out with those Israelite men and let's see if our young vivacious girls can entice those men to sin because if they sin I don't need a prophet God's already put it in. How many of y'all know that sometimes the enemy is smarter than we are? And Balak says, I know this. If they sin, if this curse thing and if this blessing thing is real, if this is real, then this must be real. They got this on them right now, and I can't get it off of them. I can't speak it off of them. I can't beg it off. I can't buy it off of them. But if they will turn their hearts away from God, this is what's going to be unleashed on them. And in chapter 25, verse number 1, Israel bowed and shit them, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And that, my friends, was the beginning of their defeat. I told you that story because... I believe that we are watching that plan, if you will, unfold before our eyes in the United States of America. We are watching 1973, they made abortion legal in America. A few years ago, how many of y'all know that don't change a thing between us and God? Men can make all the ungodly laws they want to make, it doesn't change one thing between us and God shouldn't and just a few years back they made homosexual marriage legal in America and all over this country thank God in some states we still don't do it but in a lot of states they do it and men with men the Bible says working that which is unseemly in themselves Romans chapter 1 um go to other states to get a legal document that says they are in a covenant relationship that God says is impossible it's physically impossible and women do the same thing we have them in leadership positions all across America and if you don't know this the predominant leadership the, the the majority of the leadership in the school systems across america are homosexuals and you can just know this that just like balak they don't know it but they've got an evil plan to take away the blessing of god Ooh, that ought to make you mad this morning not at people but at the insidious work of the devil. It's all about taking God's favor off of us so I can steal and I can kill and I can destroy. Because when you come through the door, oh man, this I ain't got time this morning for this, but man, when you come through the door, Jesus, 
You know, the analogy is you go into the sheepfold. You know what a sheepfold is? A brick. It's a, nah, it's not brick. Y'all know about bricks now. I can't say that no more. It, the bricks are gone. That's a stone wall that they build on the edge of town. So when the shepherds come to town, the sheep will be protected while they take care of their business. And when you come through the door, Jesus Christ, you come into the protection of God Almighty. Hallelujah. He doesn't have, you know, what is that? You know, the kids always laugh because that, 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 that Christian comedian did that thing about that, that little set about the hedge and he laughed about the hedge. I got news for him. That sounds funny when you tell it like that. He says, why does God protect us with a bush? Well, I got news for you. He needs to read his Bible. That's not what the hedge is. The hedge is not a bush. It is a brick wall for the, it, that, that mm, come on y'all. God says, I will put something out there around you where the, we know about it. Let, let me forget all that. We know about it because we read the story of Job and that hedge is not a bunch of bushes growing out of control. It's not even stones. It's the hand of God Almighty that he puts over his people. Hallelujah. And the enemy walks in and says, God, I wanted to mess with Job, but you wouldn't move your hand out of the way. Well, guess what? You ain't never moving God's hand out of the way. You can't buy it off. You can't speak it off. But it can come off. Because this is a byproduct of this. And when I cut this off, I heard Benny Hinn say about 30 years ago, and I heard him talk about the anointing that was on Elvis Presley's life. And I thought it was pretty cutting edge when he talked about it, and I considered it, and I thought, you know, that makes a lot of sense to me. Because he said this, he said, what you watched in the life of Elvis Presley is a man who was raised in a Pentecostal Assembly of God church, who had the blessing and anointing of God and the gift of singing in his life, and music was his thing. He said, and we watched a man live in the residual anointing that was on his life until it flared out. And he said, if you watch his career and you listen to his voice, over the course of his life, his voice got weaker and weaker and he lost his effectiveness. At a very early age, 40s, early 40s, died, basically killed himself. Because he says, you can, you can, <laughs> you can have the favor of God on your life and it's up here. And you can walk away, but there's a residual anointing that'll hang out on you for a while, but it starts to fade because you're not tapped into the source anymore. It's it, the, the, the power and anointing of God is so real, it'll just ride. You can ride that for a long time. But you've got to stay tapped into the source or it's going to run out. I really believe that's where America is today as a country. We are walking in a little bit of residual anointing that rests upon the, on this place because of the work of our forefathers. And I will add to that that I really believe the only thing that's keeping America afloat today is that there is a remnant of church believers who still pray and talk to God and repent for our nation. And it's our prayers that are keeping it off right now. You remember, God couldn't judge Sodom and Gomorrah until he talked to Abraham. Abraham was the problem. God wanted to judge it, but Abraham was the problem. He says, man, he said, can you just, for just a few people, can you save that place? How about 40? How about, or how about 50? How about 40? As my dad says, his first auction ever taken place on earth. I got 40. I need 40. I need to get a 40. I need a 30. I need a 35, 20, 25, 25. Got all the way down to 10. And God said, Abraham said, God, would you save it for 10? But y'all know there weren't 10. Why did God save it? Because of Abraham, that's why. It wasn't about the righteous people of, of Sodom. It was the righteousness of Abraham. And God wanted to judge it. Remember, y'all remember Nineveh? God wanted to judge Nineveh. <laughs> Jonah wanted God to judge Nineveh. 
hated Nineveh. Had a reason. They're barbarous people. That that that, by the way, is is the Iranians of today. They're barbarous people. That's why you don't deal with them. Donald Trump knew that, but our our current president is is an, is ignorant. He's ignorant of facts, of historical facts. You don't deal with the Iranian people. They are barbarous people. We learned that in our Bible. And 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 Jonah said, "I don't want to go there. They're barbarous people. They'll eat me up, man. They're cruel. They're evil." And then God said, "Nope, you're going to go preach there, and I'm going to break out a great revival there." And then you know what? That old king got touched by God. You remember what he said? He said, I know you're going to judge us. I know you're going to kill us. I know that. I know that, God. I know. I can see. We've been evil. You're going to kill us. But he said, would you give us 40 days to fast and pray? And I could just see, oh, Jonah, you know, the man of God over there going, oh, no. Yeah. They're going to fast and pray. I know God. God ain't going to kill them. He's going to let them off the hook. Yeah. You know why? I'm going to show you why. Because repentance, yes. just as real as this is, and this is, there's an R in the middle, and it has an R in it. And the R is for repentance, because repentance can turn everything. Repentance can take a man from the brinks of hell and turn it. I mean, a car can be heading his way to, to crush him and end his life, and he can repent in a moment, and everything, his total eternity changes in a moment's time when a man really repents. Because whatever sin brings on you, repentance can bring it off. Woo! Whatever sin brings on you, repentance can bring it off. Sin brings the curse, repentance brings the blessing. Hallelujah. Second Chronicles seven fourteen said, If my people, which, oh, I love this scripture. It makes me want to shout. This is a revival scripture if there ever was one. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God will heal a country. Israel bought it, hook, line, and sinker. Man, I got a bunch of young men that need to hear this morning. Don't, don't, listen, read Proverbs. I was thinking today, there's so many, there's so many books in the Bible, and there's, there's so much to read, and I've, I've actually led this church on a couple of occasions throughout a 12-month time to read the Bible all the way through. We've done that. We've given away Bibles. I'm, you know, I've, I've done everything I can do to try to teach you to read the Bible. But then I was thinking this morning, there's a lot in the Bible to read, and I get it. And I, and I do want to read the whole Bible, and I still do that. But, but, but there's some scripture, there's some chapters and some books that you need to read more than others. I would encourage you this morning, get in Proverbs and, and Psalms and just read it over and over again. And let the Word of God teach you some things about life and and what God does when when people listen to his word and and, and the wisest man that ever lived said don't be aware be aware of the works of those ungodly women well that's not just women you understand now that 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 can be anybody we don't even know what a woman is anymore anyway so yeah I feel sorry for men that are young men that are looking for a wife. You better go get a DNA check. But anyway, um, I'm not being funny. I mean it. I mean, you better make sure, man. I mean, it's crazy out there because we're confused. But God's not confused, and His word's not confused. And 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 Solomon said, "You beware." Of that woman that puts on the tapestry and puts the, you know, fixes her bed in a beautiful array and, 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 and covers it in, 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 uh, in, in perfume to entice you and, and then meets you at the door with enticing words. You be aware of her and you run. Can I just paraphrase? Run. Run from her. Shun her. There was a day when the whole country of America shunned people like that for a reason, not because we hated them, but because we wanted them to know your lifestyle is not acceptable. You're trying to destroy our children. You're trying to destroy our families, our marriages, our homes, our country, and we will not put up with it. So we'll just put you off to the side until you figure out that's a bad lifestyle. We don't hate you. 
We just can't go with this lifestyle you're living. And there were many people that came to the Lord because they realized there's a reason why you get excommunicated from the church sometimes. It's for the, Paul said, for the buffeting of the body by Satan might save your soul. We let people know that's not acceptable. And they figured it out. Now, we don't shun it. We glamorize it. And we make movies about it. Some of those Hollywood movies that have been made that, that, that make it look like being a, being a prostitute is this fantastic lifestyle. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> wow. But true repentance produces what we call transformation. <laughs> Romans 12 and 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The good and the perfect and the acceptable will of God is summed up in this, that you be like Christ. You become connected to him, you follow him, and you take on his virtues. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, gentle. You all with me? How many of you all know tolerance is not a virtue? That's a distorted view of God's virtue. And the world will tell you, oh, if you really love God, you would tolerate. Oh, no, 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 no. Long-suffering, yes, not tolerant. Long-suffering means we will put up with it until you let God fix your life. But do we tolerate that activity? Absolutely not. If your child's addicted to some kind of drug, you, let me tell you, don't you dare tolerate that in your house. You cut it off, you tell them, those drugs are not coming in my house. I will not give you money to further your addiction. I will not help you in that way. But what I will do is I'll keep this door open to you. Your bed is available and I will bring you in here and I will pray over you and I will love you and I will feed you and I will care for you. But I will not tolerate ungodly activity. But I will, I will endure this situation to get you through it. Transform. It's the Greek word metamorphos. We were get the word metamorphos from. It's the, you know, the thing, the ugly caterpillar goes in the cocoon. He comes out a beautiful butterfly. That's the picture that Romans paints to us what happens when your mind is renewed in the word of God. And true repentance, listen, okay, most Christians get caught up in this vicious cycle of saying to God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I messed up, God, I'm sorry. Because we know God will forgive us, and so we say, I'm sorry, God, and we may even mean that in the moment, and God forgives us, and then the problem is, we don't let the, look at me, we don't let the word of God renew our minds. And because we don't let the Word of God transform our mind, our thinking, if you will, we never change our thinking about the sin. We never, we, wh why, why do we fall prey to sin? Because we thought it's okay, right? And then the Holy Spirit convicts us. And then we run to God and we say, God, I feel convicted by the Holy Spirit. And I, I, I'm sorry. I'm so, oh God, I'm so sorry. We cry. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But we don't take the Word of God and let it change our thinking. And I don't know about y'all, but for me, when God changed my thinking, when he changes my thinking about a sin in my life, it always makes me angry about it. Like I realize, oh wait, that was a trick of the devil. He's trying to steal my blessing. Huh? He's trying to steal my blessing. I'm not gonna put up with the devil. And you get mad about it. And that way, when it comes up again, your mind's been changed about it, and you don't look at it and go, oh, boy, that's... Mm. 
See, what happens with the sexual immorality which is going on in our country today is people are, they have bad thinking about it because they believe the lies of Dr. Spock and every other ungodly person out there that's propagated this sexual promiscuity in America and they, and they, and they talk about it like it's, uh, I tell my wife this all the time, we don't understand this in the church, especially if you've been in, in church all your life and you've lived a, a, you know, a moral life uh, sexually all your life, then you have trouble relating to this. But when the world gets taught and you, when your kids go to school and the teacher tells them that, no, 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 sex is not about a union between a man and a woman. Sex is just sex. Marriage is marriage. Sex is sex. And, the, the, you know, it's just not the same. And they teach that to our kids. And they tell them how to have sex, how to have safe sex. And so our kids walk around with, our boys walk around with condoms in their pockets and, and they, they think it's okay and girls carry them in their purse just in case something happens, you know, after school today, we'll have one there. Because it's just sex. It ain't no big deal. It's not about marriage. And, and the main thing is about sex is we just don't want to get a disease and we definitely don't want to get pregnant because we're not married. So that's the main thing. That's what the world teaches our kids. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy, but I'm telling you that's what they teach your kids at school. They take bananas in the room. Y'all, y'all want me to get real graphic? I'm just telling you, they teach them how to do this, and 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 then then they and it's worse than that in, in a lot of schools. I can tell you other things that that I've heard and read, and, and 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 they do that. And what it does is it messes up the thought about what this is about. What they should be getting taught is that when God created man and God created woman. He then instituted the family. And when God instituted the family, he didn't call it the modern family. He called it the family. And the family consists of a man and a woman who come together and they have, they have sexual relations, which, by the way, consummates the marriage. Without it, you can't consummate the marriage. So they can say men and women are married all they want to to each other, but they're not because the Bible says that a marriage between a man and a woman is a blood covenant, just like the covenant that Christ made with the church was a blood covenant. So the marriage covenant is a blood covenant. So when a man enters into a woman, there is a bleeding because that is the sign of the covenant. And that marriage is not consummated until that happens. But when it does, then we can reproduce after our kind. We can, we can have children. And God calls that a family. And he goes on to tell us that sex in any other way is called fornication. And if you have sexual relationship with someone who is not your spouse, that is called adultery. Which is, by the way, still written in stone still resides in the Ark of the Covenant with the tablets, and it says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. In other words, God's not real pleased with it. And if we're going to keep any laws, I'm sure we've got to keep the first ten. <laughs> and when we don't, isn't it interesting that the first way that, that Israel sinned against God when the Ten Commandments were given was to have an adulterous party out in the street? God wasn't too happy about that. Y'all remember what happened. And so they tell our kids it's just sex, it doesn't matter. But God still says it matters greatly. And I'm just so thankful that repentance is still real. Um... I got I to gotta end somewhere, and here's where we're going to end this morning. I want to tell you that 9-11, that if you've not read the book The Harbinger, you should get that book and read it. It's, it's very, very enlightening. You should read it. I believe that over the last, my lifetime, let's just say over my lifetime, there have been many harbingers, some minor, some greater. 9-11 was a huge prophetic harbinger to America. God let us as a country have a glimpse into what happens when God lifts his hand because of sin. Now, 
I'm not getting into the geopolitical garbage that most people get into when they start talking about 9-11 because I'm going to tell you the greatest thing that was revealed to the church is that the sins of America are coming back to hurt us because we've opened up the curse side and we've left the blessing side. And I'm just telling you, we're hanging on by a thread because of the church today. And so what happened after 9-11 made me feel just as proud as you did. I will never, ever, as long as I live, forget our president with that fire hat on, climbing on top of that rubble with his arm around that dirty fire chief that had been trying to save lives, holding that megaphone and saying, they have visited us, but we will be visiting them soon. I'll never forget that. I was never prouder of a president. And we went and we did what we thought we needed to do to pay people back for killing 3,000 some odd people and devastating a country. And you all know that, that the events of 9-11 got the attention of the whole world. The whole world stood in shock that somebody, oh man, I'm preaching this morning, that somebody could touch America because all over this world, there were leaders that said, you can't touch America, and they didn't know why. But the reason was this, and now it was revealed that God has lifted his hand a little bit. So now we've had pestilence put upon us. Some people say it was given to us by rats or roaches or monkeys or mice, I don't know. But what we do, what, you know, and then we had somebody, I don't remember his name, something, Trump, something. I think he said, it's the China virus. Mm -hmm. China, China, China virus. The Chinese made it. Maybe they did. Maybe it came out of a rat-infested market. But I will tell you, I know where it came from. It came from the beds of America where people crawled into bed with somebody that wasn't their spouse and they said, nobody knows, nobody cares, it's just me and oh, so-and-so over here, it's two adults doing our thing, so it doesn't matter. But I got news for you, it matters greatly. And God watches out of heaven while people allow that kind of thing to go on and never say a word about it and we're just gonna be our little church sitting over here in our little thing, enjoying the blessings of God. And so we're not, you know, that's two adults. I've even heard church leaders say, oh, we need to leave that alone. Don't talk about that in the church. We don't need to run them off. We need to let them hang around so maybe we can win them to Jesus. Well, we do need to win them to Jesus, but we're never going to win them to Jesus until we tell them the truth about sin and curses and blessings and tell them how it really is. And so 9-11 was a harbinger. I think, I really believe that COVID is another harbinger to America. Look, I'm taking my hand off you and your medical system can't save you right now. Instead of calling for war and national patriotism, we should have called for a country to repent. Yes. I wish we could go back and re replay 9-12, 9-13, whatever day it was when President Bush stood on top of that heap. I wish somebody, I wish he would have let the Holy Ghost grab a hold of his heart. And when he grabbed that megaphone, instead of talking all tough and like I really liked it in my manhood, I did. I'm not telling you I didn't like every other man in America. We were like, yeah, that's all we need to do. Let's go blow some stuff up. I wish he would have stood on that heap and said, look, America, this is what just happened to us. Your sin have come back to haunt us. We have got to stop sinning. We've got to repent. We've got to turn back to God. If we don't turn back to God, our country will be no more. We will go the way of every other country that's gone before us that went the way of sin and turn their back on God. We will not be in anymore. I always thought that there would be some great war that would destroy America, but I've lived long enough now to know that I've been wrong most of my life about that. I don't believe that anymore. America is working too hard to destroy itself. We don't need an enemy. Satan says, I don't need an enemy. 
big enough to destroy them. I heard somebody say it on the radio this week. If this keeps going in one of those talk shows, this keeps going, China's going to be big enough to overtake us, and they're going to be more powerful than us. I got news for you. Not, that's not how we're going down. We're going down right now in the drug-infested big cities of America. And right here in Pinehurst, Texas, we can't even take the fence down around our church without somebody trying to do something stupid to the church building. Why? Because we are a sin-infested world today. We got drugs. We don't just have drugs in the city. We got drugs right in We got drugs in my backyard. Just our neighbor crawling over the fence high on drugs. You know, neighbor next door partied all Friday night. Just blew the doors off the place. They do it at least twice a month. Have a big beer party over there. Big old, big old, nasty, immoral beer party to celebrate their ungodliness. And if you think that God's not watching, you have lost your ever-loving mind. God is watching. And God says, I'm just looking for people. If my people, if my people, which are called by my name, will repent and turn from their evil ways. Then, see, God don't hear the sinner. He doesn't hear the sinner that cries and says, oh, God, bless me. He only hears the sinner when he cries for forgiveness. But his people, he hears. And he says, when my people call out my name and they pray, I'm going to hear from heaven. When they repent and they turn from their evil ways, I'm going to hear them. And I'm going to heal them, but I'm also going to heal their land because that's the thing that brings back the blessing of God. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, I love you today. Oh, God. I hear my pastor from years ago saying there's not enough O's in our prayers anymore. We don't say, oh, God, this is, God, this is desperate. This is desperate. This is desperate. And our country is in a desperate place. And I pray, God, for everybody, whether in this building or on the Internet or wherever, when they hear this message, that, God, they will turn from their evil ways and repent. That means to have a change of mind, to have my mind remo removed, re renewed, transformed, changed, metamorphosed into something that is godly from something that was ungodly oh god how we need repentance in our school district leaders today and we need repentance in our politicians today and we need repentance in the in the in the uh, the, the the legal systems of today but more than that and first and foremost we need repentance in the pulpit and we mean repentance in the house of god where we turn away from sin and those things that are separating us from you and we get serious once again about our relationship with you make that your prayer this morning. God, I want to be closer to you than ever before. Just lift your hands to him right now. Just say, God, forgive me where I failed you. And God, bring me into close relationship with you. I don't want to walk afar from you. I want to walk close to you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord where we have failed you. Forgive us where we've come short of the glory of our God. Forgive us where we've allowed sin and iniquity to enter into our hearts. Cleanse our hands and our hearts today, Lord. We want to be clean on the inside and the outside. Wash us, wash us, wash us. Change our minds today. Holy Ghost, change our minds today. Change our minds today. Change our minds today. Let me tell you, sometimes the reason we struggle with addictions for so long is we don't let God change our mind about it. God change our minds about some of those things that we're addicted to today. Set my friends free. Set my friends free, Lord. Let the Word of God be established in our hearts today. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. There's nothing the enemy can attach me to that you got, you're not greater. That You're greater than all my problems. You're greater than all my needs. You're greater than my addictions, Lord. You're greater than my fleshly desires. My love for you is greater than what my flesh loves. Yes. yes. Help us to feed our spirit so our flesh will become weak. Help us to stop feeding that weak flesh and help us to feed the strength of the spirit of man. 
by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, by the power and the anointing of God. In the name of Jesus, forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord, we pray. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah.